formerly our day. Uh, so Dr. Professor Moshe Cohen uh, will start the second day. Uh, he got his uh, PhD in Louisiana and then he came with a fresh PhD to Barilan. And I spent, I think, four years, lovely years with him from being a fresh postdoc to living as a senior mathematician. So that was a great uh, pleasure, and I'm very happy that he agreed to come and, uh, and explain to us, because as you will see, he knows how to do it very, very well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I know uh, it's a lot of math that you're putting up with. And thanks to the organizers. I think this is wonderful that we're contributing to the future of mathematics by making sure that uh, women have a seat. And, um, you know, I know, we have someone here who's just done amazing work in that field for so many years. I came to Israel and could already see all the stuff that she had been doing. Um, I'll talk about some work that I did while in her research group. Her research group is called the Emmy Neuether Research Institute, which is named after a famous woman mathematician, Emmy Neuether, who you could look up. Um, not only that, but she made sure that she had lots of women working with her, including women postdocs and women students. So I'll talk about work uh, with Meirav and work with Anna Zark. I'll tell you a funny story about um, Anna's uh, master's thesis and awesome math that she figured out that none of us could figure out, none of the guys could figure out. So um, she's, you know, another superstar. And it's so great that Mina is able to um, really bring up a lot of these superstars. I will then tell you about a little bit about work um, that I've done with undergrad students. And part of, part of my hope today is just to encourage you that maybe you'd want to do some research. If math is not your major, hopefully you would do that in your own area. Or if math is your major, hopefully I'm enticing you with some ideas. Um, okay, so I started at Binghamton, at SUNY Binghamton, uh, and here was a bunch of us at graduation. Uh, what I loved about being a junior and senior at Binghamton was I started to make friends with all the people in my math classes because we were spending a lot of time together. Uh, we started doing homeworks together, which I think was a really, really great thing for us. Um, again, the idea came from a woman, Gail, um, Gail Tang, who was a year above us, who said, you know, I, I know things. Like, it's going to be easier if we work together on some of these problems. So today I have some problems. And in uh, using Gail's idea, we'll work a little bit together. And we'll see how much more fun it is doing math together. Um, after Binghamton, I went to Louisiana State University. Uh, grad school did not cost me anything. And they paid me for it. So those of you who are thinking about a future in STEM, I encourage you to reach out to your professors to think about um, what grad school might be like for you, or come talk to any of us throughout the day. And then I was lucky enough, uh, Mina offered me a job. And I mean, I'm from New York, so I flew all the way down to Louisiana to go get a, I drove actually to go start grad school. It took me all the way across the country. Um, I went to Arizona for a summer of research at an REU, took me all the way across the country. And then my math took me all the way across the world and I got to go to Israel to work with Mina. Um, and then while I was there, I got to see Europe and I got to go do math in Europe and stuff like that. So um, really math unlocked a lot of doors for me and, and Mina unlocked a lot of doors for me. Uh, that was really amazing. Um, after that, I was at the Technion, uh, Israel's tech, uh, Institute of Technology. And then I ended up at Vassar College briefly, which used to be a women's college up until like 1960 something, 1969 maybe, when other schools were finally letting women into college. So, I mean, we've clearly come so far, but we clearly have so much further to go. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, your generation of women scientists goes off and uh, creates the new world for us. Uh, so while I was at Vassar College, they have this awesome program where they paired students who wanted to do research with professors who wanted students. And this is Sarah Goodhill, who worked with me on a project. Um, she had not even started college yet. And I gave her a problem on line arrangements. And 
I just said, well, I didn't even give her a problem. I just started teaching her some of the basics. And then she asked her own question, and she spent the rest of the summer answering the question that she had picked from all the ingredients that I had shown her. And at the end of the summer, she came up with a result. And it turns out that I didn't know really how to find the result until she came up with it. She counted something. And then I looked online, and I found exactly that number. Um, and it turns out that someone had already proven it. Not a big deal, but the person who proved it was actually a Vassar professor, and she had proven it in 1938. Like, crazy connection. It was so cool seeing Sarah think about something that someone else had already thought about, which I viewed as being kind of lost in the literature. I mean, I don't regularly pick up books from 1938 to read what's in them. So I thought that was really fun. And again, she came with no background, and she was able to do some projects. So if you're a, longer, a lower class student, I would definitely still talk to your professors, because who knows what um, insight you'll be able to bring to problems. So here is the first um, topic uh, project that we'll be thinking about. A line arrangement is a collection of lines in the plant. Well, I'll use the little um, laser pointer here. So this axis and this axis really aren't, don't count as lines. They're just there to give me some kind of direction. So forget that one. This one is actually covered up by a line. So here is one line arrangement, and here is another line arrangement. So the first question, and you can like work together, is mathematicians look at objects and they say, how are two objects the same or how are two objects different? And we saw that with braids. I think some of you already picked that up when we were studying braids. Um, so why don't you spend like a few minutes talking, looking at the pictures and talking to someone next to you. How are these two objects the same and how are they different? And I'll just kind of wander around and listen to you. Yes. Yeah, so all of this, I've done the color coding because if you just stared at a whole bunch of things, it would be really hard to talk about them. So in here, I don't know, there are some red lines over here, there are some red lines over here, and that's actually a great clue. So I color coded them so you might look at some of the colors. So you could ask how many lines are there over here, how many lines are there over there. So talk. Does anyone want to say anything into the microphone? <laughs> <So intimidating. laughs> Can I hear some of what you're saying? Hi. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to look at like how exactly the lines are um, not exactly bisecting, but like hitting the vertices of the triangle. Oh, the, the lines through the triangle. Nice. Right. Yeah, literally the red one. It looks like it's just a different wire intercept. This same like slope. Oh, I like that we're using algebra in there. Are they using like the golden ratio or something like that? Because it doesn't look quite in half, but... Oh yeah, we're, we're definitely using some uh, weird numbers. You want to say something? I'm just listening in. I'm just eavesdropping. Oh, well, I guess, okay. Uh, well, the red lines on both of them uh, pass through the vertices of the triangles. Oh yeah, they were talking about that too. Oh. Um, on, the, on the right, they pass through the edges, they're kind of like tangent, I guess. Well, well, you know, I mean, it's an edge, so it's not like there's one tangent line, but, you know, it's, they, they are tangent lines, I guess. On, on the left, it's not like this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the outside of the space. The corners of the triangles are on the dotted line. Also, I take that back what I said. Oh, I think we got a good answer. Okay, so, um, we had at least two speakers yesterday who told you that when geometry is really hard, turn it into algebra because algebra is so great. Today, I'm going to throw out all the algebra and we're going to look at the geometry. So if you like looking at pictures, do I have some math for you? So when you're looking at these things, you are already able to figure out all these topics. So what, what's some of the things? For example, here there's some triangles and here there's some triangles and I guess there's 
three black lines that form a triangle, and actually the same three black lines that form a triangle. And here are the three dotted blue lines that form a triangle, and here are the three dotted blue lines that form a triangle. And a lot of you realize that it's the red lines that are different in both of them. But I think you picked up on the fact that the corners of this red triangle over here and the corners of the red triangle over here, fill in the blanks. They're on the blue dotted lines, right? So that's why I had them all like color coded and everything like that. So it was a little bit easier to see. Um, you've touched on something really, really cool. It turns out that they're different arrangements, right? They don't look the same. So let's say that they're different geometrically. Remember uh, Nancy's cool video where they're looking at the flask from algebra and someone's listening to it and you know, things like that. So if we looked at this through the lens of geometry, we would say, well, look, they look different. But if we look through the lens of where the corners are, where those lines intersect, then in fact these two arrangements of lines are the same. And I know, make that face because it, it, it's weird. So I'm, in a, a few slides I'm going to tell you how to think about them in terms of where the lines intersect. And this I view as thinking about it combinatorially. And combinatorics is the study or the art of counting. And I love combinatorics, so I'll tell you a little bit more as we go. But I want to pose some really crazy questions here. What do we mean by lines, and what do we mean by plane? Now, I gave you this problem, and you were like off to the races, and you could talk about it without even defining things. But then, if you wanted to sit through a class or start a research project, then we would formalize these things and see what we could do to make them a little bit more complicated. But already you figured out some things that, that we, didn't even, uh, we didn't even teach you. Um, so this is why I love uh, when students come to work with me on projects because they're already really, really good at doing math. They just don't know a bunch of definitions yet. But who cares? You already are good at stuff. So if you are excited about any of the topics today, if you're excited about combinatorics, here's some local people that you can go and talk to and ask about. Um, I found this by going to your website, um, the University of Miami Math Department website, and just looking up all the research groups. Um, so here are some people in combinatorics. I actually uh, went to a conference organized by Professor Benedetti once. It was really awesome. Um, we've heard a lot from algebraic geometers at this conference, so if you really love this topic, look how many people you can ask. So many people here. Um, I'm a topologist, and I actually study knots, and I will... Uh, if there's time, although I didn't actually look at any time at all, so start cutting me off if I need to, but I might copy Mina's idea and give an appendix in which I talk a little bit about knots and give you some candy. Um, but Dr. Baker, Professor Baker, is a knot theorist. So if you're interested in knots, I would go and talk to him. I'm sure the other professors could help you as well. And um, parametrized curves are kind of fun. Maybe you've learned that in calculus. So even if you're not in some of these hardcore math classes, um, you're still learning a lot of complicated mathematics, so I would just go talk to your professors, start that relationship, and start talking to them, and, and listen to the advice that they have to give, and ask them questions. All right, so we're now at the toy portion of today. So you have in front of you a bunch of squiggles. Why don't you unroll those squiggles and turn them into lines as best that you can? Um, so. I have here a Greek theorem. It's a theorem due to Pappus um, a long, long time ago. So we're, we're talking about almost 2,000 years. So if you take these lines and spread them out, you should notice that we have like two of each color and then a lone one. So choose one of the pairs, and those pair, that pair is going to form this first two lines, the white line and the white line. Now if you want, you can just copy me and put this line and that line exactly as written. But don't listen to me. Do whatever you want. You can change the angle. You can change the distance between them. The only thing is that I need to put these x's in between so they can't be too far apart. But make them different. Do some weird things. Yeah, you can make them intersect. And the cool thing about these things, squish them down and they'll stick to the table. And then we'll just squish everything on top of it. So once you have those two lines, I want you to take another color, like I don't know, red or something, choose two lines and make an X out of them. 
and just make them so that they intersect those two lines. I call this one A and I call this one B and this is little A and little B. But really, just as long as it's on the left-hand side, you can make it anywhere. So you're choosing two lines, you're making an X, and you're just leaving room because we're going to have to put an X that's next to it. And you can make them really squishy and next to each other, or you can make it spread out a little bit. So did everyone make the first X? And then, yeah, squish it down, because then it, the wax will stick to the other um, thing that's on there. And now I know we're not dealing with lines. We're dealing with squiggly things, so it's a little bit harder. Um, all right, if you got the first one, now let's do the last one, this yellow one. We're going to make another X, so choose two lines of the same color. And uh, yeah, you already figured it out. This X has to meet up with the red X at point B. So you want to put, I don't know if you've seen like two X's next to each other, sometimes they're stylistically written where the X's touch each other, like, I don't know, Roman numerals or something like that. So we have the red X already, and you're making the yellow X. Um, and of course, whatever colors that you want is totally fine. Um, awesome, so you made two X's and you squished them down a whole bunch. Do you need some, do you want to play with some too? Okay. And then the third pair of, of uh, the, the last color that's left, you're going to make a giant X that goes through those other X's. I know, that one's a little bit long. I hope you have enough strings for that if you need some more strings. So you made an X on the left and you made an X on the right. Now let's make this big X that crosses through the whole thing. Try to pull them tight because it might be a little bit far. If you want, here's some other... In case they don't reach, you can use some other colors. Did it work? So here's how to tell if it works. You made three X's, and you're going to look at the X marks the spot on each of those X's. And if your squiggles were close enough to lines, it should be that your three X's are all on a line. And that's a result due to Pappus all the way back, you know, almost 2,000 years ago. Did it, did it work for anyone? Yeah? So once you have that, squish it down, squish it down, and then you can pick up, the, exactly like you did, you can pick up the whole thing off of the, the, the table, and then you can actually show each other the different versions. So I gave you a bunch of ingredients and you made different pictures. So I don't know, can anyone pick up theirs? All right, I see yours are like, these are kind of steep lines and yours don't look as steep, but you still managed to get Pappus's theorem to hold. Can I see yours? Oh, you made them even steeper than this. And you got Pappus's theorem. Oh, you made them parallel. Oh, that's awesome. And yeah, they're pretty close. I think there's just a couple of the, the big ones that could be straightened out a little bit. So, okay, that's my fault because I gave you these squiggly lines instead of giving you perfect ones. Did anyone else? Oh, all the way back there. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. I like that. Oh, nice, you got parallel too. So what's fun about this was that I gave you an ingredient list and you managed to build something that were all geometrically different. But I claim that, oh, can I see yours too? You got one? Wow. Um, so if there's a ninth string, if you want to take the ninth string, you can fill in this last line and try to, try to show that they're parallel. Uh, not parallel, show that they're all on, on the same line. Um, so I give you a bunch of instructions, and you created different geometric pictures, but I claim that all of your pictures are going to follow those instructions, that kind of cookbook. And the instructions that I gave you are what I call combinatorics, the combinatorics of the arrangement. So here's what I told you. Start with two lines and put points on them, capital A, B, and C, and lowercase a, B, and C. Start with two red lines, make an X out of them, and have them go through A and B. Start with two blue lines, make them make an X at point Y, and make them go through points A and C. Have two lines that are yellow, have them make an X at point Z, and have them go through points B and C. And if you would follow that rule, then Pappus's theorem says that X, Y, and Z are all going to be on the same line. So that's what I mean when I talk about the combinatorics. And if you think back to that original, those original two pictures that we were like going back and forth about, then um, 
uh, then you could use this kind of recipe idea and the two pictures would have the same recipe. And that's because the corners of the red, I'll go back, the corners of the red triangle in one lie on the corners, uh, lie on the blue lines and the corners of the red triangle in the other lie on the blue lines. So all of the intersection information is the same. Did everyone follow that one okay? Which do you prefer? Do you prefer the recipe or do you prefer the geometry? Do you like the picture or do you like, you like the geometry? And, and that's okay. And in math, there are areas that you feel stronger with, and there's areas that you feel weaker with, and that's okay. It doesn't make you not a mathematician or not a scientist if you don't know everything or you can't think about it in any way. Fast forward to, I guess, the time that Mina was giving um, our, her presentation about um, Leonardo, and we have, uh, we have Descartes. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, and Descartes also gave us Cartesian coordinates, the x and y axis. So everything that we did over here had no x axis and y axis. But now over here, we can try to take our picture and find equations of the lines. So what's the equation of a line, just normally? y is equal to mx plus b. That's a little confusing to me. So I'm going to take all of the letters and I'm going to put them all on one side and set them equal to 0. Is that OK with you? Just some easy algebra? Now, what I'm going to do is when I take two things and multiply them together to get 0, either one is 0, the other is 0, or both are 0. And if that's true, then I could take this line and this line and multiply them together, and I would get an equation for two lines together. And instead of two lines, I could do n lines for as many lines as I would want. So let's look at this example. What is this first x telling me? Just like here, we did this. And we set that equal to 0. So here we get x is equal to 0, which is the y-axis. Exactly. This is the y-axis. So this equation, or this part of the equation, gives me this. So how about y is equal to 0? What does that tell me? The x-axis. OK. What does x minus 1 equal 0 give me? x is equal to 1, so that's this one. And what about y minus 1 is 0? So it turns out if you're an algebraic geometer, instead of studying these pictures that you've drawn over there, you just take everything, you convert it into a bunch of algebra, and then you do some things with the algebra, and then you bring it back to the geometry. Or you start with the algebra, and you move it to the geometry, and then you bring it back to the algebra. So algebraic geometers like to look at these things from two different directions at the same time. Everyone follow that OK? Um, so I like to look at where these lines intersect because we just talked about where those lines intersected in the last Pappus theorem. Uh, so here, if this is x is equal to 1 and y is equal, to, uh, sorry, x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0, then this point is just the origin, 0, 0. And then you could find the intersections of the other points, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. But it turns out when you have six things, they should intersect, uh, sorry, when you have four things, they should intersect six times, not four times. So what's missing in this picture? Where are the extra intersections that should be there that aren't really there? So it looks like this line intersects with this line, check. Uh, this line intersects with this line, check. What's missing? Do you have like those parallel lines? Yeah, we, we know from high school parallel lines never intersect. Well, forget high school. We're in college now. So let's make them intersect. Where do you want these two lines that look parallel to here? They don't intersect here. They don't intersect here. They don't intersect here. Say it again. Oh, we could go into another axis. We can do something like that. That's even more out of the box thinking than I was thinking. I like that, though. See, this is why I love working with students, because you come up with answers that I never would have come up with. Um, and that works. We could do that. And actually, secretly, that's what's going on. But we'll do the easier version of it. How about I make them intersect all the way at infinity? Is that OK? So I'm just going to add a point at infinity all the way over here. And then these two lines are going to intersect all the way at infinity. And I'm going to add a point at infinity over there. 
Now I have to add an infinite number of points at infinity. So like, if I have these two parallel lines, then they would intersect over here. And I would get like kind of a big circle of points at infinity that I would need to add to my plane. Is everyone okay with that? So the weird thing about it is that this point at infinity is really the same as this point at infinity. Because it's just where these two lines intersect. And they only intersect once, so we could either say they intersect on the right or we can say they intersect on the left. And secretly, if you build this, you get the thing that you learned in the talk yesterday about the real projective do you remember the square and it was A and B and then A and B in the other direction? So this is giving us an algebraic intuition for why we should build the real projective plane. I don't know, I always loved seeing the same thing from many different ways going back to Nancy's video. So it turns out that what we'll do is we'll talk about, instead of real lines, we'll talk about real projective lines. And the algebra is so easy. Look, here is just a constant. I'm going to take a constant and multiply it by z, a third variable, which is exactly what you said, and that's the, the way to think about this thing. We are using a third variable in order to do it. And that tells us that the real projective plane, you can imagine, is living in three-dimensional space. Is everyone okay with that? Awesome. That's hard. So the fact that you're okay with that is great. You want to do another problem? Here is a problem. Uh, this is my excuse to make a fart joke at a math conference that I call cutting the cheese. We're going to start with the cheese. Did everyone enjoy the party last night with those awesome cheeses? I really like them. Uh, I took the knife and I cut it and I cut off a slice. So let's imagine you have this three-dimensional chunk of cheese and you have a really, really big knife. That knife just chops the whole cheese off. How many different pieces can you cut if you only have a certain number of cuts? Now, I don't know about you, but thinking in three dimensions is difficult for me. Anyone else? So let's think about two dimensions. Again, you're going to find some people working around you if you have paper, even better. Um, let's think instead of a cheese, let's think about a cheese pizza. So draw a circle, draw a big cheese pizza circle. And then we're now going to try to cut this pizza into pieces using just lines that cut through them. And I'll give you a hint, if you like to play with these toys, you can just use these as the cuts. So you can just, if you don't have paper, you can just squish these down onto, here's some more. Um, you can just squish these down onto, oh perfect, you made a, a pizza out of it. And now use the rest of the lines here, I'll give you some more. Um, and now you can try to figure it out. So let's try to make two columns. One column is n, and one column is um, the number of pieces of your cheese pizza that you have. And we're, remember, we're trying to get the most number of pieces. I, I'm a topologist, so I don't really care how big the pieces are, just as long as we get one piece for every person. So see if you can make two columns. I don't know. Uh, let's do n is equal to 1. How many pieces do you get for n is equal to 1? If I have one cut. Two slices, right? So keep going. See how much further that you can go. I'm going to walk around and listen to you, and we'll see if we can solve a two-dimensional version of this cutting the cheese problem. I don't know how much longer I have. OK. <laughs> oh, what number did you get next? Four. Four. Oh. Oh, you're on n is equal to 3 already. Good. Oh, I like these pizzas. Oh, you got n is equal to 3. What's that? The pieces have to be equal. No, the pieces can be what, oh, I'm a topologist, so they can be whatever size that you want. Oh, that's a little hard to see, right? <laughs> you might want to zoom in a little bit. Even you can forget about the pizza and just imagine it on the plane if you want to do that, so that they don't have to intersect so closely to each other. Yeah, that's a great idea. You can take the line and move it around to try to figure out. So I like that. That's how we cut pizza normally. So with four cuts, how many slices did you get? Eight. That one's like the nice regular way. I claim that if you make the cuts in slightly different places, you can get more than eight. Oh, 11? That's a high number. That's more than eight. And I'll give you another hint. It has something to do with the parallel lines that we were talking about last time. Oh, 
I'll, I'll give you more hints. The parallel lines somehow don't achieve the perfect number. So I think parallel is not going to give us our maximum number, but we can learn something from those parallel. So, okay, if you got n is equal to 3, could you go up to n is equal to 4? That might be hard to do. How high can you go and try to figure out some mac maximum numbers? I'm just going to write down what people are saying so far. We have n, and we have the number of pieces. 1, we got 2. 2, we got 4. 3. Someone said 7, I think. Did anyone beat 7 for 3? I know, you might, you're, you might already be on a higher number. What, what's your n and what's your number? For n is, e oh, someone got 11 for, for 4? Yeah, so move, move some things out of the way if you need to. You can make, for, for seven, did you get like a, a triangle in the middle? See if you can make that triangle a little bit bigger. So just reset some of your lines a little bit. I love this. I didn't even think that we could use these toys to do this problem. And you've already figured that one out for me. And I think this is way better than drawing. So again, I love working with undergrads on projects. You got it? Oh, cool. Great. All right. Do you want to continue to work a little bit? Yeah, OK. I'll give you some more time. I'm, I'm just glad that you're enjoying math. That's OK with me. But I'm going to ask the audience, what are you learning here? <laughs> I know. I'll come back around. I'll come back around. What are we learning? These sticky things are handy. <laughs> so mathematicians like to use tools to model things. What are you learning? Oh, I'm trying to make congruent triangles. I don't really know why. Oh, congruent triangles, it turns out, are going to invo involve parallel lines, which is going to be another great question, but it's not going to answer this question. So this is an example of what Sarah did. She just took the ingredients that I gave her and she asked her own questions. Oh, you got 16 for that one? Did you learn anything? Oh, cool. 15, 16? Yeah, come a little closer and come get one of these toys and you can start playing. Okay. Wait, I want to hear that. Yeah, I was going to say Fibonacci, but that doesn't sound right because it's just adding on to whatever we had the previous time. So it's like oh, well, let's try that. So here's what mathematicians love doing. And you can continue to think. And mathematicians love finding patterns of things. And then once we fi find patterns, we want to find patterns in the patterns. So what, what are you thinking about here? Oh, let's add another column. What happens if I have zero cuts? How many pieces do I have? One. So look, if I had one, two, and four, what would you think would be the next number? Eight. But it turns out we didn't get eight for this one. Oh, tricky math. Always trying to trick us. OK, so that's seven, and then 11, and then maybe 16. Did anyone figure out uh, like a pattern looking at those numbers? What were you thinking? OK, so what would, it, what would we increase by here? Let's, let's try to make an equation. So if this is like fn, so f of n plus 1. So let's check. Um, so f of 1 would be f of 0, which is 1, plus n, which is 1. And f of 2 would be um, f of 1 plus 2. And f of 3 would be f of 3 plus 3. In math, we call that a conjecture. 
Does everyone think that maybe that conjecture might be true? Mathematicians, not enough. Not enough for us. So what do you do when you have a conjecture? You try to prove it. That's a little bit harder, and we're not going to go into that today, but mathematicians and people who think mathematically all over STEM are looking for patterns and then just trying to prove the things that they've learned from those patterns. Is that fun? You want to, I have another problem. Should we do another one? Okay. Oh, uh, let me talk about this. Um, I'm a topologist, and I hate pieces. Because pieces, you have to keep track of them, and you have to count how many there are. There are. That's a lie. I really like, as a combinatorialist, I really like counting the pieces. But as a topologist, it's hard to keep track of all of them. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to turn my real projective lines into complex projective lines. I'm going to turn my real projective plane into a complex projective plane through the magic of math. So a real line is like one dimensional, and a complex line is like two dimensional. And a real plane is two dimensional, and a complex, this is like C and C, two copies of C. So this is really four dimensional math. So what you've done is that you've drawn pictures which are like a shadow of what's going on in four-dimensional math. Isn't that fun? I think of line arrangements as like a gateway to like way, way, way more complicated math just by playing around with pictures. And this is why I think geometry is really fun and I hope to inspire you to think geometrically. One really great thing about this is that the complement, remember that word complement from yesterday? It's like whatever is left over. So if I take this pizza and I cut it up, I delete that cut, I end up with pieces. But if I take something in four dimensions and I cut it by something in three, uh, sorry, in two dimensions, it turns out it doesn't cut the space up. And I don't know, is anyone else having trouble seeing in four dimensions? OK, so let's do it one dimension down. Let's think about three-dimensional space. And let's think about a one-dimensional thing living in three-dimensional space. So here is a line that goes infinitely in every direction. Can I get from this side of the line to that side of the line without touching the line? How? Right? So I'm allowed to do this if I have two extra dimensions of space. So if I'm two-dimensional, if this is now a two-dimensional thing living in four-dimensional space, I have two extra dimensions to be able to do this with. OK, so topologists then get to study this complement. And that's going to show up a little bit later, well, depending on how long I go. Let's do another problem. This is an older problem. It's called the orchard problem. I um, found this in a paper by these three authors. Grunbaum is an author of a textbook that I'm using that I really like. And Sloan, I think, is the person who came up with this online, and seek, an online encyclopedia of integer sequences. O E O, online encyclopedia of integer sequences.org. So if you go into this, website and type out this sequence of numbers that we found, just like Fibonacci or a different sequence, it'll tell you where it comes from mathematically. And so if you want, you can look up lots of cool mathematical things through this website. So here's a cool problem that goes back many years. It's called the orchard problem. Uh, our plane, the board, our plane is now an orchard. And we're going to plant trees in the orchard. And the trees are just going to be points. And then I'm going to draw lines between those points. And the lines are like little sidewalks that take you to sit underneath each tree. So that's why it's called an orchard problem. Um, I want to draw the points anywhere in the plane that I want, anywhere that you want to make them work, such that I can draw t lines. And each line has exactly three points on it. So now I'm going to give you the number of points. And then we're going to try to figure out the number of lines making the same kind of table. OK, so here's the number of points, and here's the number of lines. So let's see if we can start off. What is the rule about the number of lines? Each line 
So when do I get my first line? How many points do I need in order to get my first line? Three. So in, fr in fact, this is zero, and this is zero, and this is zero. And we finally get one over here. And the picture for this is just three points on a line. Let's do this one together. It's a little challenging. Now I have four points. What's the maximum number of lines that I can put on it? You can move the points anywhere you want. Is it one? Why? What's your thinking? Well, it can't be on the line because each line has exactly three. So it has to be off the line somewhere. Do we have enough points to make another line? No. So that one's going to be one. Awesome. Now I have five points. And I can follow this picture, or I can move them anywhere I want that's convenient to me. How can I arrange five points to maximize the number of lines? Is that good? Is that what you were thinking? Oh, so look, we got two. Awesome. Woohoo! We finally got to two. All right, should we keep going? Six points. Oh, great, great question, right? We did that the last time we've, we found. So let's get a few more, because remember the last one? It was one, two, and four. And we would have just been like, duh, it's two to the end. Done, next problem. But that was totally wrong. So I like your idea, but usually I like try to keep a bank of conjectures. And I keep checking until I can figure out whether that's true or not. But let's see. We'll see how it goes. What do we think for six? OK, so can anyone see a way to do three? What's a way to do three? Or here, right? So I could definitely get three. Can we go higher than three? This is hard. Oh, yeah, it's like that. Remember with the Pappus where we made those x's and these points? So let's do the same thing. Here's an x. We have six points. How many lines? Four. Oh, this disproves our first conjecture. But OK, I mean, not, not the end of the thing. I, I will secretly tell you that there is no answer. There is no formula for this. And this paper just tries to figure out, as n gets really, really large, what they act like, because no one can find the exact formula. So if you found it you know, in the first five minutes of thinking about it, I think Burr and Grunbaum and Sloan might be really mad. <laughs> All right. Should we keep going? OK, what about seven? Now, it might be the case that we need to start like drawing a new picture. We could try to keep adding it onto here, but it might be the case that we have to rethink our, our original assumptions. Six, you can get? Whoa. Another X idea, but like a weird TX kind of. Now, this is, I mean, OK, I'll put question marks here, right? We didn't like prove that this was the best, and that might take a little bit of work, but OK, we have some things here. And it turns out, no matter what, we can't do better than this. Um, I would really, really love to try to figure out a way to connect these three points in a line. So I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to make this my line. <laughs> turns out, I can't do that if I follow the rules of Euclidean geometry. But if I change my geometry, then I can do that. So mathematicians like to break rules whenever we can, just to think of new things. All right, so I'll show you some pictures. Um, 
here is, I guess we did all of this up to this step. And the next one is really hard. You have to like rearrange everything. What's this one look like? I'm looking over there. Look down. Look down. At your desk. <laughs> Does that look like Pappus' theorem? But only if you chose parallel lines, and I think you were the one who had parallel lines, so that's that one. And then another, you know, bunch of cool pictures like this. Again, un unsolved. Mathematicians have been working on this for a long time. They can't figure out what the pattern is there. Yep. Oh. Can I give you money for uh, you know asking such a thing? I like symmetry. Does anyone like symmetry? Yeah. I always look for symmetry in things. So yeah, all of these look like they have lots and lots of symmetry. Um, part of that is it makes it more pleasing to look at. We could have definitely drawn Pappus' theorem in a way that didn't have symmetry. Um, so sometimes it's an artifact, and sometimes it's actually teaching you something new and cool. And I, if I, I don't know how much time I have, but um, I can talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. I, I think they didn't prove that there is not a closed formula, but what they did is they looked at these numbers as you get bigger and bigger, and they proved bounds. Um, so if you wanted TP for some high P, you would know that there's a formula for an upper bound, and you know that there would be a formula for a lower bound. But they don't, and I don't know because I haven't followed up with this theorem um, in the last 10 years, but um, back then they didn't know if there was an exact formula, and I might guess that maybe there isn't, because geometry is really hard, and sometimes geometry problems can't be counted using combinatorics. Did that answer your question enough? Okay. I don't know. I like pictures. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. How much? I'll, sk I'll skip some things. There's some more awesome pictures. One of my students found like some nice, beautiful symmetries. This is the pile of arrangements that someone wrote in 1880s. And he looked at this one and was like, I don't like that picture. And he drew the picture to have some beautiful symmetries in it. Um, actually, you can spin it around, and it has a Z5. It, it can kind of rotate like a clock going up to 5 o'clock. And then also, there's a way to take the inside and the outside and like flip them. Does anyone have that toy that like you can flip things and it turns into something cool? So you could take this whole picture and flip it and turn the outside star into the inside star. Um, these are a bunch of textbooks, which if you're interested in this area, this is the one that I use with students because I think it's by Grunbaum. It's very geometric. I like that one a lot. Um, this one on Matroid theory is by James Oxley, and it's very combinatorial. So if anyone's interested in combinatorics, I think this is a cool topic as well. All right. Um, can I do two appendices and then I'll stop? Is that okay? Um, quick, really quick. So Anna Zark worked with us, and we did a whole project. And uh, Faye and Mayrob drew this picture and drew this picture, and published the paper, and it was done, and that's it. But Anna came and looked at these two pictures, and she noticed something. Wait, say it again. Say it. Who who made the oh oh that was what do you what do you notice? Yeah, there's some way to go from one to the other. Someone want to figure out how to do it geometrically? Like, where might this point end up? Where do you think that point should go in this picture? Oh, do that hand motion again. <laughs> Am I doing your hand motion right? What, what's, what's the thing that this is geometrically? A reflection? What if we make a line that goes like roughly like this and reflect that point gets reflected up there and that point gets reflected down here? So Anna just looked through this paper, stared at pictures, and learned something that none of us had seen already. Awesome. We wrote a whole paper based off of this idea that she came up with. 
And not only did it work for this example, but it worked for a bunch of other examples. I thought that was cool. And sorry, work with students, pictures, equations. I love knots. Um, I'm just going to have a fun little thing. Um, lots of different cool things that you can do with knots. But this is the Scientific American article that lets you do quantum computing with braids uh, from 2006. So if you want to look up that, you can download the, um, the thing. And I have candy for everybody because I have to try to beat Nancy for best talk. And if you take one of these, here, do you want to just pass it around? Um, if you take one of these, you can pull it, pull apart and make knots and tie knots with them. Um, and then if you don't mind just collecting up your pieces and rolling them up back together. Thank you, everybody.